that uh, if you received an invitation to an event, what would make you either accept it or decline it? Now, I'm not the big high-tech guy. I, I don't tweet and I don't beep or whatever that is, and I'm not on, I'm not in face page, okay? So, so if, if, if you're watching online, you, you can, you can I, I don't know how you do that, but you, John reads comments, so send them in, and I guess they'll be there later for people to see. So, but I won't, but you can do that. If, if you enjoy doing that, knock yourself out, okay? But uh, that, this question is going to kind of uh, get answered as we go through the scriptures for today, as we continue our study on uh, Mark chapter 5. So let's have a word of prayer. Again, Lord, we, we come as your people, thankful that you bless us with your word of truth. Open our hearts, Lord, now by the power of your Holy Spirit, that uh, you would teach us, Lord, about being faithful disciples, fearlessly following you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the first church I served when I was right out of uh, seminary, it was 1975, it was the Lutheran Church in Lake Oswego. Now I didn't know a lot about the ethnic history of Lutheran churches, but that one in Lake Oswego was definitely Norwegian. I mean, it had this really, really strong Norwegian band. The pastor spoke fluent Norwegian, and a lot of the people did there too. And uh, so I, I learned to sing, uh, Yer so glad if you veld, every Christmas Eve. Okay, probably butchered that if you're Norwegian, but at least I learned that kind of. And I heard lots of Sven and Oli jokes <laughs> about these two Norwegian guys living in Minnesota. And there's one of my favorites that relates to what we're going to talk about today, where Sven and Oli go out to do ice fishing in the middle of winter on a frozen over lake. Okay? So they go out and they take their buckets and their bait and they drill two holes in the ice and they're sitting about 10 feet apart and, and they start fishing and, and Oli starts just bringing you know, one fish after another, after another. Sven, no bites. I mean, nothing's happening at all. So after a little bit, Sven says, Hey, Oli, how come you catching all the fish and I'm not catching any of the fish? And Oli says, mm-hmm, 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 says, Oli, I can't understand the word coming out of your mouth. How are you catching all those fish? He goes, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. says, I Oli, you're not making any sense. I can't understand you. Oli says, <laughs> you got to keep your worms warm. Now, now, if you live in Minnesota and you go ice fishing when it's minus 40 degrees, I guess that's funny, okay? But you have to appreciate that culture. But in a weird way, that kind of relates to what we're talking about today, because if you're going to be a successful fisherman, whatever venture, even if it's ice fishing, you got to know two basic things, where the fish are, right, and how to attract the fish. So it's interesting that... Jesus kind of picks up on this theme a little bit in the beginning of our study that we did several weeks ago in Mark chapter 1. So I want to go back to Mark 1 a little bit and then relate it to what uh, is talked about in Mark chapter 5. So get out your study sheet if you would. You've got it there. It's, there's a, there's a, a place to take some notes. The scriptures are there, so follow along. So back in Mark chapter 1, Jesus begins to call people to follow him. And two of the people that he called were Peter and Andrew. They were fishermen. They were professional fishermen. And Jesus came you know, on the shore. He saw them fishing. And he, and he says this amazing thing to them about he, this picture he gives them about what it means to follow him in, in his ministry. And he, and he says that, he says, come and follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Do you remember that, the, the, the wording of this in the old King James Version? I will make you what? Fishers of men. Okay, so this is more p politically correct, okay? We, so, uh, fishing for people. Well, so if we're to be following fearlessly and fishing faithfully, was that enough Fs in a row there? Okay, then two questions that we've got to ask and answer, which we're going to focus on today. One is, uh, what does 
fishing for people involved? I mean, what does it mean? How do you do it? Because it sounds kind of weird, but so what is Jesus asking us to do exactly? And the second question that relates to that is why? Why fish for people? Why take the time? Why make the effort? So we're going to look at both those questions today. And they, they, are, they are related together. Because with anything, if, if you're asked to do something and you don't understand the why behind it, most likely you're not going to do, follow through and do the how. So it's pretty basic. These, these two are together. So we're going to begin this morning looking at the how question. What does it mean to be fishing for people? First point that uh, comes out of, uh, that we're going to focus on today is fishing involves more than wishing. It involves inviting. So what I'd like to, to do is, if I can uh, take the, uh, take the, the uh, uh, privilege here of just making a, an addition onto Jesus' analogy here of fishing for people, I'll bring it up to date. So imagine this, imagine that there is a polluted lake. And in this lake there are fish. And the fish are dying. And also imagine that you care about the fish. You would like to save the fish, as many fish as possible, but you can't clean up the water, it's so polluted. What do you do? What do you do besides wish that something would happen good for the fish? Well, the answer is, is to take action. And then imagine a expert in fish and wildlife comes along and says, hey, I've, I've got the solution. So come with me, follow me, and I'll show you how to do it. And he has a way of, of gathering the fish and taking them out of the polluted water and putting them in clean water. You get the picture? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not too, uh, too, too much of a brain teaser, is it? OK. <laughs> Well, the point of it is, we live in a polluted world, polluted by sin, causing all kind of devastation and destruction and, and even leading to death and harm and all kinds of things. And uh, it's, it's not enough just if you care for people, especially those being affected so negatively by the sin of this world. It's, just not, it's not enough to just wish that something would happen. If you truly love them, you would want to do something. And that's why Jesus came, to invite you to join with him and others to bring life to people who are struggling so much with hardship in life. And we see examples of this in, in the scripture where people who are, have discovered who Jesus is go and invite others to help understand who he is. Uh, back at, at Jesus, as Jesus began his ministry in John chapter 1, uh, we read the story about Philip. Philip heard Jesus teach. He recognized immediately that he was the Messiah, God in the flesh, that he was the one that had come to, to bring salvation to the world. So what did Philip do? Did he keep it to himself? No. He went to his friend Nathaniel, and this is what we read. So Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, we have found the Messiah. And he said, come and see. Come with me. I invite you, Nathaniel, to come with me and check this out. Because Philip cared so much about Nathaniel that he wanted Nathaniel to know the truth about who Jesus was. Just one example of, of what it means to fish for people by reaching out and inviting someone to come with you to understand more of who Jesus is. Here's another picture that Jesus gives in um, Matthew 22, and it's, it's, on, it's in your uh, outline, where Jesus describes, and we talked about this in the children's message, where Jesus describes the kingdom of God like a party, a king who throws a banquet, and he has servants who have been invited to the party, and this is what he says to the servants. Go out now to the street corners and invite everyone you see. Because this party just isn't for a few or for a select certain number. This party, God's kingdom, God's love, is for everyone. And we've got the joy of letting people know that around us. 
So that's kind of a, some pictures of what it means to fish, going out and inviting others to come with you to discover the joy of Jesus Christ. Now, this is all backed up, and we see another kind of a picture or example of this in Mark chapter 5. And uh, so I'm going to summarize this. This is a long story. I ask that you read it for yourself because this is the first. This is uh, when I was in high school, our leader challenged us to read a gospel in you know, like one chapter a week, kind of like what we're doing here. And I, I'm dyslexic. I don't like reading. I'm horrible at it. So I chose Mark because it's the shortest gospel. <laughs> I'm going to get done twice as fast if I, instead of picking John. So I picked Mark, and hey, it was okay. Jesus does this, and Jesus does that, and goes here. He does Jesus things all over the place. And then we get to Mark chapter 5. I'm going, wow, this is an incredible story. I've never heard about this stuff before. Here's the story. So Jesus gets in a boat with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, sails along the shore. They stop at a Gentile region and get, get off. Now, we know it's Gentile region because there's a lot of pig farmers. Jewish people would not be raising pigs because of dietary laws. So that's how we know that this is a kind of a Gentile area. And as soon as Jesus gets off the boat with the disciples, a man comes towards him to talk with him. This man is demon-possessed. Not possessed by one demon, but by a legion. In fact, the demon's name is Legion, which means he has many demons inside of him. And we're not told how or why, but this weird conversation ensues back and forth. And Jesus has mercy on this man and casts the demons out into a herd of pigs. 2,000 pigs who then run off the cliff and drown. Now, I'm telling you, if you're a high school kid and you've never read the Bible much before and read that story, it's like, that's the kind of Jesus I want to get to know more about. I mean, that's an amazing story. But we're not going to talk about that part of it today. <laughs> Only to say this, and which is a sermon for another day. This story tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. God in the flesh who came, who has the power over sin and sickness and evil and even death itself. And I just want to say that um, if you've got questions about this whole demon possession thing, if you, if you don't get it, if you don't understand, talk with Pastor John when he gets back. <laughs> okay. But the serious point for us this morning is this. There is a lot of things that enslave people's souls in this polluted world today. It Things have a grip on people's lives, and it may not seem to them that they could ever be free. This story tells us that Jesus has power over the darkest things in our life and in this world and can free us and deliver us and save us and give us a new start if we simply come to him and ask. The reason that I wanted to read this story is moving on to the second point, because it, it's a story that tells us what it means to fish for people. And it comes out of the very end of the story. Now, after Jesus does this incredible miracle and this guy is healed and he's normal and the pigs are all you know, floating in the water, the people, the townspeople look at this and say, uh, could you move on? <laughs> This is a little too freaky for us. Could you just get out of here? So Jesus and the disciples, they, they start to get in the boat. But the man that's just been delivered says to Jesus this. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no. Well, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. Wouldn't Jesus want him to follow and and, and uh, go with him, Jesus had a different purpose, a purpose for him. This is what we read. Jesus said, no, go home to your family. Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. 
So the man did that, but he did more than that. He just didn't go to his home and his family. It says he went to visit the 10 towns of that region. That region is called the Decapolis. Deca means 10, polis means, means city. There's 10 cities in this region. And he went to all of those cities telling the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he had told them. He was answering the call, accepting the call to go out and fish for people and inviting them to learn more about who Jesus was. And they were amazed. So fishing for people is not a matter of reciting. Reciting 100 Bible verses and beating people over the head with those verses. It's not about reciting. It's not about indicting. It's not about telling people how wrong they are and how bad they are and they're going to go to hell. It's not about reciting. It's not about indicting. It's about inviting them. Inviting them with kindness and grace to discover who Jesus Christ is and about the wonderful the, the gifts that Jesus Christ offers to those who say yes to him. Inviting in Jesus' name has power. It has power to save. It has power to make uh, a difference in people's lives. I've witnessed this personally. I've been so humbled by it. And it's amazing to see what God can do when someone simply invites, takes that risk, takes that time to say, would you, would you come? Would you like to come and see? We'll put that picture up. This is a picture of the youth group that uh, I was working with at Lake Oswego. Uh, this is a picture from 1985. Uh, there's 108 kids in this picture. That was our youth choir. There was actually more kids in the youth group, but this was the choir. And then and this year we went to Washington, D.C., and we sang at the Kennedy Center. We, we got an invitation to do that from the, uh, and from the uh, Secretary of Interior, who happened to be a former member at Our Saviors. <laughs> helps to know people. <laughs> helps, helps to have connections. All right. Um, but I, I just want to tell you the back story, because when I got to Lake Oswego, on a good, on a good night, we had... Maybe, maybe 10 kids, maybe. Um, and at that time, we were, because I'm the new associate pastor, I'm kind of doing what, you know, the church has always done. And if you grew up Lutheran, you remember what confirmation was like. Who, who grew up Lutheran, you know, in the old style? Catechism, memorization, tests, and then you stood up and had to get quizzed in front, you know, in front of the church. Well, is it any wonder after the kids went through that, most of them never came back? <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of get that. I, I almost felt that way. It's like, why would I want to continue doing this after being treated like that? So slowly, after a couple of years, I could change confirmation to make it be more welcoming to kids and asking them what they want to do and how, how, how they would like to do things. And, and I remember we had a retreat. And I said, how can we make things better? Now, be careful when you ask that question. Because you're going to get some real honest answers. And I remember one of the kids saying, Pastor Doug, we really love you, but we're kind of tired coming every night and sitting in a room and just reading the Bible, talking about the Bible. Can we do something? Can we, can we, can we do something different? And so then we started brainstorming, well, what would you like to do? And a couple of the kids liked to sing. And a couple of others said, well, I, could, I don't know how to sing, but I could learn to sing. And this is just when, this is like 76, 77, just when contemporary Christian music was taking off, if you've seen the movie Jesus Revolution, how many of you have seen that? This is just when all of that good Christian music started happening and kids started listening and you could sing, you, we could sing it in church and so they wanted to form a choir and sing that music. Well, we only had 10 kids and most of them were girls and it was like, okay, if we're gonna do this, we need some more people. We had a person on staff that knew how to lead choirs. So she said, yeah, we probably need about 20 kids and we need some guys. So if, if by April 1st we can get 20 people, mo a lot more guys, then we can go on a trip right after school's out. We'll go on a 10-day trip, music trip. And there was 10 and then there was 12 and then there was 14, right? You know, and it was, and this was 
I wasn't doing this. this. These were kids inviting their friends, most of them who did not go to church. And we, we talked about why we're doing it and how we're doing it. We went on that first trip. I had no idea what I was doing. I got back. I was exhausted. I mean, and we sang for churches, Lutheran churches, that had no kids. They were so amazed that to see a group of kids like this singing great music and enjoying themselves, they were blown away. And the kids knew that they were making a difference in the lives of the people in these churches to encourage them that, that faith is not dead. We got back from that trip. I was exhausted. And one of the kids came up and said, so what are we doing next week? <laughs> I said, well, well we, it's summer break. I'll see you in the fall. I go, no, no, we got to get together. And so it started, and it grew, and more kids came. And, and finally then, you know, several years later, we had this number of kids. And again, the point of me telling you this, this is not me doing this, okay? I mean, I was responsible for, for caring for these kids and, and lifting them up. And all of these kids, were, were, they were in small groups. I trained the leaders, and the leaders worked with the kids. And all of these, they were cared for and nurtured in faith. The kids were doing the inviting. And this is how it grew from a handful to this number. And uh, it, it was amazing. It was amazing to see. And this... This choir, what we did, has, has had an impact on this church. Now you gotta go back, who was here in the, wow, 2005 range? Remember Amy and uh, Brian and Amy Campy? They're in that picture. Do you remember Pete McDougall, vice principal at the high? He's in that picture, okay? Other, uh, do you remember uh, Ray Cook? Ray isn't here today, but if you know Ray Cook, his daughters were in that picture, in that choir. This, it's amazing what was happening back then is, is reaching out and blessing people here today. And I just want to give a more practical example of that. And uh, Alice, you're here today. Could, could you just do one minute, I mean 30 seconds of standing up and say, how did you get here? In 96. So um, I brought my husband to this church because Pastor Doug was the pastor at Our Saviors and we came back from college. Um, we wanted a church that we could come to. Joe was raised Catholic and I was raised Lutheran and Methodist. And so we came here and we have been here ever since and raised our kids in the church. And even before that, Pastor Doug married my mom and her current husband and my twin sister, Amelia, who Yeah. But how did that originally all happen? Oh, you tell that part. Okay, I'll tell that part. Okay, thank you, Alice. Okay, I'll tell that. Thank you. So, Jesse and I, okay, my daughter, Jesse, who sings up here, uh, it was uh, Thanksgiving, I think, junior high. We were at the local school with the, our dog and met these two twin girls who had just moved here. And I don't think you guys knew many people, right? So it's like, well, why don't you come and be a part of things? And it started there, and then I, you know, I mean, it just kind of grew from there. You guys were in junior high, church stuff together, and then in GCS. I mean, it's when we invite other people in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit has the power to touch people's hearts to change lives. This is not our invitation. It's God's invitation working through us. And I just, so that's why I just wanted to tell you the story to, to be encouraged to, to understand the power of invitation when we reach out to other people. Now, just quickly, I want to move on to the second question. That's the how, how we fish. We, you know, we don't w simply wish, we invite other people. So here's, here's the why. Why do we do this? And let me put that uh, chart up there. So this is an... This is the best chart that I could find that we could maybe kind of read about decline in church attendance in the United States. Charts are a little bit goofy, but it doesn't go from zero to 100. It starts at 35 and, and goes down, and the bottom line starts at 1970 and comes over to about 2015. But you can see the trajectory. If you could see a chart, and I wanted to find one, I couldn't do it, that goes back to the 50s. Do you know what church attendance was like in the, in the 50s in the United States? What? about 60%. 
So from the 50s to the 70s, it dropped from there to 30%. And in 2015, now it's down to 20-something percent, and the latest poll shows that it's down under 20%. Do you see the trajectory of that line? If it continues, what's going to happen? I mean, that's, that's a devastating chart to look at. But it's not, it, 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 but something can be done about that. And we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. But the, the point of it is that you know, back in the 1950s, virtually every, everyone kind of went to church, or most people did, and so there, wasn't, there weren't any fish. I mean, everybody, everybody was someplace, okay? If you invited someone, they go, oh, I already go to church. Oh, okay, I already go to church. Today, in our culture, in this time, a great, great majority of people have no connection to a church. And I'm not, we're not saying that as a derogatory thing or a negative thing or like, oh, that's horrible, all those people who don't go to church. It's just simply a cultural fact that there's a lot of people who maybe have never really understood who Jesus is or maybe they've never met a Christian who is kind and gracious and caring like you. That if you invited them, they might say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. So there, there's one chart just to encourage us to understand the times we live in are more like the times that Jesus was living in than any time in history between there. Here's another chart, or here's another little article. This is from the Surgeon General from 10 days ago. There's a new epidemic. I don't know if you've heard about it. He's identified a new epidemic that's going around. It's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. It's, it's especially in younger folks. It's, it, it was accentuated in the pandemic and then magnified through social media that people in, in, in their teens and 20s and 30s are getting disconnected more and more and more, and it's leading to severe depression, darkness, anxiety, and even suicide. And it is dangerous. No answers, but that's the, that's the dilemma of living in a culture like we live in, polluted waters. Well, the good news is God has an answer. God came to give us the answer. God came to say, listen, I don't want anyone to be isolated. I don't want anyone to be lonely. I don't want anyone to feel like they're the only ones. God came to fill every human heart with his love, his joy, his peace in Jesus Christ. And then to call us to be in a family, in a community, where we share those values, where we encourage one another, where we build one another up, where we can fight off all of those dark and depressing kinds of things. Now, the church isn't perfect. We're not perfect. But what's the alternative? This is God's, we are God's gift to this world. And so if you want to kind of boil it all down. Why make the effort to invite people? Why, why go through the, all of the, the things involved with fishing for people and inviting them? First, because it shows that we love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now, I know obey kind of sounds harsh, and I, I, the, it's not the idea of, you better do this or else, Jesus says. It's not an obligation, it's not a duty, it's a privilege to do what Jesus has asked us to do. It's a way for us to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you invited me, you accepted me, you have encouraged me, and I would like to do the same for other people. So first, it shows that we love Jesus. Secondly, it shows that we love other people around us. Now, you all know the golden rule, right? Do unto others before they do it unto you. No, that's not it. Do unto others as they do it unto you, right? So if somebody treats you like a jerk, you get to treat them like a jerk. Nope, that's not it either. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do it unto you. Treat other people like you want them to treat you, okay? So if you were lonely, if you were depressed, if you were feeling lost, if you were feeling dark, wouldn't you want someone to bring hope, to bring life? to do something to lift you up and to encourage you, to invite you to be part of something that is good and life-changing and transformative. If you love people, yes, you would do that. That's, 
So the golden rule is kind of attached you know, to what I'd call the platinum rule. Do for other people what Jesus has done for you. Jesus has invited you. Jesus has encouraged you. Jesus has accepted you. So out of thankfulness, could you do that for other people around you? Yeah. Again, we weren't meant when we received that invitation and accepted it to keep it to ourselves. Accepting that invitation is implied that we're going to reach out and share that invitation with other people and let them know what it means to live in the blessing of God's kingdom and, and experience life at its best. Okay, so if you do that and they say no, oh no, what do you do if they say no? Well, uh, okay, uh, you know, you're not going to hate them. They're not going to hate you. It's just, it's just a no. It's just not now. But you've planted a seed because you've done it with kindness. You've done it with grace. You let them know that you care enough about them. No, you're not going to bug them and bother them and, you know, harangue them about it. You've planted a seed that maybe in a month or six months, something will happen and they'll remember that invitation, or you'll know that maybe it's time again to say, would you like to come? Maybe the answer will be yes. Or maybe somebody else, years later, will invite them, and the seed that you planted will come to fruition in that invitation. But either way, God's at work in people's hearts, and never doubt what can happen. Continue to pray and reach out and bless people. So I want to wrap up with this goofy little video that I hope can encourage you to think about ways of reaching out and inviting. We've got lots of things to reach out and invite. We've got uh, you know, the neighborhood walk. We've got vacation Bible school coming up. We've got, the, we've got the, 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 the ranch experience. I mean, there's lots of things besides inviting people to come with you to worship. So watch and take this little video to heart. this like every week, but would you like to ride to church with me? Oh, come on, Mrs. Edwards, you'll like my church. We have some hot music. It may not be what you're bumping at all, but it's hot. We get down. What do you say, Mrs. Edwards? Oh, uh, I suppose. I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. I know, I've goofed up that. <laughs> Yeah, it's goofy, right? But it's, uh, it's true, right? Hey, I know I goofed up the slides, and so we'll, we'll go back to, to, if you're here today to, um, uh, and for worship, and maybe, or you're watching online, and you've never kind of thought about what it means to accept the invitation to believe in Jesus, 
Maybe you've heard some things over the years, but you're never quite sure how it all relates and how it all fits. I just want to say thank you for coming today and thank you for listening and understanding that t- today Jesus is extending an invitation to you to be part of his kingdom. To, and all you have to do is say yes. In fact, in your, in your, uh, in your sheet that you've got, there's a, there's a space for you to write your name down or your initials to say, yes, Lord, I accept the invitation to follow you as Lord and Savior of my life. And you know, there will be joy in heaven, you know, rejoicing for anyone who says yes and accepts this invitation. So pray about that if that's something you've never done. And go, we'll go to the next slide. And then if you have accepted that invitation and you, you know, are part of God's family and you've, you know how blessed it is to be a part of God's kingdom, would you accept the calling to fish for people, fish for someone, and invite them? And there's a place for you to write their name down. Who would that be? Who would you invite? Could you pray about that and write someone down? And maybe, maybe it's to the next Sunday or one of the events coming up, but just, just pray about that, that you wouldn't keep it to yourself, but you would reach out and share the joy that God has brought into your life. Let us